First, I'd like to welcome everybody. My name is Nicole Sergeant RJ Regester, and this will be the first in my series on tilt management. Uh, this will be the first of seven videos that's going to be covering primarily tilt, but also some other psychological concepts as they apply to poker. So the plan of action for today's video is going to be first to introduce myself, Second, to provide a general guide as to what is going to be covered throughout the entire series. And then third, we're going to discuss why talking about psychological principles and plugging mental leaks in your poker game is so important. Alright, so the first thing I'd like to do is start off by, and the reason I chose this picture is because for those of you who are familiar with 2 plus 2, I'm one of the green mods on there with the Spock avatar. So again, my name is Nicole Regester. I go by Sergeant RJ online on 2 plus 2. I'm the forum moderator in the news, views, and gossip subforum on 2 plus 2. But more sort of germane to my experience in poker is, just generally speaking, I, I am a, a recreational poker player. I've been playing poker since uh, about 2008, and mostly in no-limit hold'em uh, tournaments and some low-limit uh, full ring and six, six max cash. Uh, when I play live, it, it tends to be tournaments anywhere uh, in the $100 to, you know, $500,000 range. Normally I have played the World Series main event one time. Um, online, I used to play a lot of STTs and other uh, sit-and-go types. So, I do have experience as a poker player. I'm not a professional, but because I have played, that does give me some experience in what it's like to go through some of the stuff that poker players go through in terms of variance, in terms of tilt, in terms of just the mental parts of the game that somebody who's never played poker or only understands poker on a theoretical level might not have as good a grasp of. But what's really important in terms of this particular presentation is the, my psychological background. I currently hold a master's in counseling psychology and I'm also finishing up work right now on my PhD in counseling, which is uh, basically a sister discipline of, of psychology. They're very similar. But what that means is that throughout the years, I've worked with dozens of people in a variety of settings, formal and informal, on basically taking what I've learned you know, about psychology, about counseling, about how to improve your psychological and mental capacity to you know work with challenges in your life and that's you know what I do that's what I'm studying for and training to do so I have a lot of experience in taking you know psychological principles or counseling principles from a theoretical to actually applying them and helping people to be able to use theirs in their lives to improve the things that they're trying to improve Now, why am I telling you about my poker background and my psychology background? Well, you're not going to hire a poker coach who either A, doesn't play the game that you, would, you specialize in or that you would want to specialize in, or if that person actually sort of sucks at that game. I mean, you're not going to hire uh, you know, a heads-up coach if you want to play full ring, and you're also not going to hire a heads-up coach if you want to be a heads-up player who has demonstrated over hundreds of thousands of hands that they're not a winning player. So if you're going to take the time to actually attempt to learn how to plug the mental leaks in your game, you should know where I'm coming from. You should know that I have a solid background in, in psychology and counseling and that my training has actually given me the experience necessary to take you know, a lot of psychobabble terminology and actually help people apply it to their lives. So, because I also have experience as a poker player, although 
it is recreational. I'm not a poker professional. The fact that I have both of those backgrounds, a psychology background and a poker background, hopefully will demonstrate to you that I'm somebody who's worth listening to when it comes to trying to plug mental leaks in your poker game. You can judge that for yourself based on this entire series. Um, Heads Up Sit and Go has a couple of other of my uh, videos that you can also look at. I, I know at least one or two of them are free. So it gives you some idea of basically where I'm coming from and you can judge for yourself if I'm somebody that you should listen to if you're trying to work on mental leaks in your game. All right. Introducing the series here, this is going to be an entire series on tilt management. That's the main focus, but there's also going to be a couple other psychological concepts thrown in that poker players, I think, often struggle with. Things like time management, stress management, finding you know balance in between managing your, your poker schedule and sort of your life schedule. So, but the reason why tilt is the primary focus of this series is that this is one of those things that A, affects a lot of poker players, and B, there, there's usually no one right answer. It's a lot like poker in that way. There's not always a correct way to play X hand. You know, it changes. I mean, even playing a hand like aces where people are like, well, you should always want to get your hand in all the money in preflop if possible. But, you know, there's a variety of factor factors. Are you playing a tournament? Are you on, on the bubble of a mega satellite? You know, do you know that you have opponents at the table who are very likely that you're going to be able to trap them? And all of those factors play into even playing a very strong basic hand like ace-ace. You're not going to play it the same way every time. And by the same token, people go on tilt for a variety of different reasons. There is no one right answer. If there was a sort of a right answer a single solution to solving tilt, we probably already know it already. It'd be all over the forums on 2 plus 2. Every poker coach would know, hey, this is what causes tilt. Don't do this and you won't tilt. And it wouldn't be a significant problem. So the reason why this series is a necessity is because there are so many different reasons why people go on tilt. So there is no one right answer. This isn't a simple solution. So what I'm going to try to do through the course of this series is not just talk about, here's a tilt scenario, what could you do to fix it, but to actually talk about the underlying global factors that contribute to DILT, primarily um, the way that you think about the game and how that leads to tilt. So that by teaching you and showing you some examples of the underlying things that cause tilt, you can then apply them to your specific situation and use that to sort of design your own tilt prevention or detilting strategies as the principles apply to you. And this will make a lot more sense as we go on through the series. I'm just telling you now basically what I hope to accomplish in this series is basically to give poker players the tools that they need, the psychological knowledge that they need about things that usually drive tilt so that they can take that knowledge and apply it to themselves, apply it to their own game and figure out what's going to work best for them in terms of preventing tilt, recognizing when you're at tilt at any given moment and being able to very quickly come off tilt if you figure out that you, you're, you're actually on tilt while you're playing. So this is the series outline. This is the first video. That one's going to be the introduction. The second one's going to be on defining tilt, recognizing tilt, recovering from tilt, preventing tilt, and then finally the two last ones are going to be on other broad psychological concepts which are poker life balance and stress management. So as you can see this is going to be a seven course series and through the course of the series you know each video is going to build on the one before it, particularly in terms of tilt. So that hopefully by the time you get through the entire series, you're going to have a, a fairly thorough understanding of 
how you can use you know some psychological principles to determine your own tilt level when when am I on tilt how can I recover from tilt how can I prevent tilt for me as opposed to there being like okay here's tilt here's what causes it this is always what causes it if every single player did X Y and Z there would be no tilt that's not what this is looking to accomplish this is looking to give you the necessary background so that you can figure out and tailor your own tilt program basically So again, we're going to cover a lot of stuff about tilt, and we're also then at the end going to give you some additional tools again because I, I think a lot of poker players, you know, you know, do sometimes struggle with stuff like life balance. It's very easy to get very wrapped up in poker. It's also very easy for people to burn out. You hear about it all the time. You know, particularly uh, you know players who've been playing for two to three maybe you know four years even very successful players but eventually they sort of burn out and that's not an uncommon thing this actually happens in, in, a, in a lot of high pressure high stress uh, job fields which I think most people would agree especially the people who understand poker you know it's very easy to sort of watch it on TV and go, oh, it's a bunch of people sitting around playing, you know, cards for money. But there's a lot more to it than that, and I think most poker players realize that. And realize that, you know, if this is something you do for a living, it's pretty high stress because you don't always have, you know, a steady income. You know, even the best players go through negative variants. So we're going to include some things on life balance and stress management, basically just to round out this entire series so that it's, not strictly about tilt, but on overall psychological concepts and how you can use them to improve, you know, your poker game as well as your poker game as it fits into your life. So, we're going to talk a little bit now about the importance of plugging leaks, mental leaks in your game, because really that's what this entire series is about is the importance of plugging not just the technical leaks in your game but the mental leaks in your game and that's why this series is important when people originally start playing poker they usually get into it because it's a fun game but they pretty quickly figure out that poker is a lot more fun when you're winning than when you're losing so they start to try to understand game theory they start looking at actual strategy and optimal play and that's when we get into talking about plugging leaks usually when poker players discuss that they're discussing technical leaks in their play things like calling pot size bets when you have only a, a gut shot straight draw you know you don't have the correct odds you don't have the correct variance or expected positive uh, expectation to make that call in that spot so if you've been doing that, that's a leak in your game, and you're looking to plug that leak by understanding that you can't call a bet of that size with so few outs unless you know that your opponent is going to basically throw money at you on the river when you get there. By the same token, poker is not just a game of, of math and cards and correctly putting people on hand, range, hand ranges and determining the mathematically plus EV game. Poker is also a game of observation and psychology. Sometimes psychology can actually even overrule the math. You know, for example, let's say, you know, you're faced with a river, you're the first person to act, you have a, your opponent on a range of hands that always beats what you're holding, but you're read on your opponent, you know, based on their posture, based on their tells, you know, maybe that you've observed something about them that tells you that they're physically uncomfortable, and you determine that in that situation, if you apply enough pressure with a large enough bet, you can get them to fold a certain percentage of the time. That's an example of the poker overriding the math. Mathematically, you're beat, but psychologically, you know, you still have an advantage because you get to act first you get to attempt to apply pressure that's why psychology in poker is also important it's not just about math 
So because poker involves incomplete information, you know, we don't know what our opponents have, and we're trying to observe things like their body language, their betting patterns, you know, their tone, their speech when they're talking, being able to stay focused and mentally alert is pretty crucial to optimal play. Anything that can detract from your ability to think rationally, to focus for long periods of time, to observe your opponents and correctly analyze their, their betting patterns, their tone, their posture, their physical tells, anything that detracts your ability to do that is going to hurt your poker game regardless of how mathematically optimal your basic strategy might be. Because while I'm not at all saying that math isn't important, hand ranges aren't important, understanding technically correct plus EV poker play isn't important. I'm not saying that at all, but it's not the only thing in poker. That's why tilt is something that is so incredibly important to understand and to try to avoid at all costs at the poker table. Just like anything with the ability to cloud your mind and make focus and clear thinking more difficult is something that you're going to seek to eliminate from your poker game. Tilt is one of those things. Tilt is incredibly distracting. It's incredibly... It has the incredible potential to cloud your decision-making process. And that's why it can be classified as a mental leak that you would want to work on just to, like you would want to plug the technical leaks in your game. And the best players are the ones that recognize and adapt to both the math and the psychology of poker. So playing a total poker game. Just to wrap up, what I'm basically trying to do with this series is to give you some of the tools necessary to improve your mental poker game, your psychological poker game, with a heavy emphasis on what I think is one of the most serious mental leaks in poker, which is tilt. So hopefully by the time this series is over, you're going to not only understand tilt and what causes it, but also give you the tools necessary to take that and apply it to your own game so you can work on plugging that leak. So what I, I've done today is I've given you, you know, an introduction, you know, my background so that you can decide for yourself if I'm worth listening to in terms of psychology and poker. Also covered what we're going to talk about this series and also gave you some general reasons why I think, you know, undertaking to plug your mental leaks to understanding tilt and why it's so detrimental to people's games and why you should work on plugging mental leaks, how that's going to improve your game. It's not just about math. I'm not at all telling people to not work on the, your technical game and have coaches or, you know, post on 2 plus 2 about optimal strategy. But I think if you neglect the psychological aspect as well, it's going to be a potential weakness in your game. And that's something that I hope you're interested in working on. And that's the purpose of this series. So starting with next series, part two, we're going to define tilt as well as get more in depth as to why it's a potential problem in poker with some examples that should clearly illustrate how tilt negatively impacts a poker game, your, your poker game potentially. This has been Nicole, Sergeant RJ Regester. I want to thank you for listening and look forward to working with you on the ent this entire series on tilt prevention, management, and other psychological principles.